not screech and halt to make that slow down and make that turn. You know, I'm, I'm kind of concerned about how much more accidents you're going to have, how much more problem it is for people to get out on those from Tolliver and on 213 and so forth. I, I kind of see it kind of disastrous. I think myself, I think a light would be the perfect solution. I would think it would cost a little less too. I know I don't know that. I don't have all that information. And so, and also I was just thinking is that what about what do you, what's happening with pedestrians? You got this screaming down the street to the turnabout and then you've got all these cars going all sorts of directions in this turnabout. Where's the people going? Pedestrians, where are they going? That's my concern. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to speak to that a little bit. Um, the, um, I had this similar concern about a roundabout there. Um, but when ODOT came in, they pointed out that, well, first of all, something that you may be aware of is that uh, that, er that intersection is one of the intersections in Wall that has the most traffic accidents today. So there are the most traffic accidents there. And they said that if, and if you think about it, it makes sense. If you put a traffic light there where there wasn't one, you will have people speeding into stop traffic. So they said it's much safer, but actually increase traffic accidents according to their study if we put a stoplight there versus a traffic uh, circle. So that's why in conversation with ODOT, we decided um, that I decided to support that. So just a little information for you. They also, uh, we petitioned the state for speed reduction signs for 35 miles an hour between the uh, uh, city limits, uh, which would be north to the city limits south, and the signs are now up mm -hmm. to slow traffic down. And that was one concern that, that we got handled. So thank you for coming in. Okay. Okay. Can we go back to the gentleman who was speak, speaking about the industrial hemp plant? Can you talk, speak to the noise factor? We talked about the odor factor, but we didn't really speak about the noise factor at all. Yeah, I mean. Can you come back up to the yeah, microphone? Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, we are, in my opinion, using the site as it was originally intended. Um, the only pieces of equipment we've added so far are conveyors on the inlet of the dryer um, but what the Stutzmans were using that for which was a used or recycled newspaper into kind of kitty litter um, we're, we're using it as it was intended in fact when we took ownership of that building it was completely out of alignment and all the gears were bad and so we've we had some people come out there we've reduced the decibel noise quite considerably since we've um, commissioned that site. Um, I'm not sure if they were running 24 hours, um, but given you know, the, the kind of cadence at which our farmers come, we do run not 24 hours a day, but we do run 20 hours a day with two downtimes of uh, two hours for preventative maintenance so that we don't cause any issues on that equipment. Are the dryers, the dryers shouldn't be noisy, are they? The dryers, I mean, the dryers quite, um, it is quite loud, is it? but it was, um, I guess my question is, was there concerns with the noise prior to us coming in? Um, and then are there concerns about the um, wood drying facility, which has a, about a similar noise, which is across the street on the, on the cul-de-sac to us? That's something we'd have to look into. I don't know. And there's so. construction going on there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, All yeah. right. Well, thank you for the information. Yep. Okay. Has council read the agenda for tonight? Okay. I'll need a motion and a second to approve it. Can make a motion that we approve the agenda. I second it. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye.
Okay, it is approved. Uh, consent agenda, was everybody happy with the, okay, I'll need a motion and a second. So moved. To, huh? to accept. Oh, so moved, I'm sorry. Sorry, <laughs> to accept. <laughs> second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Next is general public hearings, there are none, so general business. Item A, ODOT Intergovernmental Agreement for Oregon 213 and Tolliver Road Roundabout. And Mr. Huff, you have the floor. You ready? So within your council packet, uh, there's a memo from myself that generally explains what we're here to talk about tonight one of them it's it's kind of a in reality a two-part uh, question one is uh, city council either authorizing the city manager to sign the intergovernmental agreement with ODOT for uh, Oregon 213 and Tolliver Road or or not and the uh, Second part of that that we have to solve as well because it's part of the bigger picture is how do we pay for it? and um, As as you all are aware from previous presentations uh, from uh, uh, ODOT uh, Whether it was the safety audit that was done last spring and summer or the presentation that ODOT made to us a few meetings ago uh, and Councillor Palumbo said it well. It's a very dangerous intersection. We don't have life-threatening accidents necessarily, but some of them are life-altering, and there's a number of them. Uh, ODOT actually went through a, a, a long uh, study to produce some data on which intersection would be actually the safest. Mm -hmm. The crashes actually go up for a traffic signal and go way down for a roundabout. So um, from a safety standpoint, a convenience standpoint, uh, reduction of time, um, ODOT's moving forward with a roundabout design. So the numbers you have in the intergovernmental agreement that are there, the total project cost is 8,976,249 if you turn to page two of the intergovernmental agreement and the and the item in here that probably gives folks some little bit of issue the city's cost in that total project is two million two hundred forty seven thousand nine hundred ninety dollars and i should mention that tova pelts and mandy putney from odot are here tonight to offer any uh, assistance or answer any questions you may have um, and uh, Tova was here a few meetings ago with Paul Scarlett and they, they were the ones that made mm -hmm. the presentation so uh, and I do want to say that ODOT has been very uh, adamant about making this project happen um, and, and we appreciate that so I put with you uh, I laid at your uh, desks there a spreadsheet that Public Works Director Gerald Fisher put together for you um, with regard to an Oregon Transportation Investment uh, Infrastructure Bank loan and I also put together kind of a layout of how we would pay it back um, you get a loan you have to pay it back uh, one of the things that the loan uh, would do for the city of Malala is provide us the ability to bridge some gaps uh, that we have as far as uh, putting all your eggs in one basket you still have to be able to to fund other <laughs> programs that you want to you want to fund so uh, keeping the spreadsheet off to the side for a second here the um, the infrastructure loan that we've gotten some preliminary information on um, is a low interest loan you you don't actually have to start payments until the construct until you actually draw on that loan okay otherwise you're if um, if you draw on it then you're making interest payments and it's down the road and this project is down the road a little bit two or three years and uh, so it allows us to continue to function um, 
as we need to draw down that those payments as we we are required to make payments for design and some of the other things that that are going to come to pay uh, play here as we've talked in the past we would want to set up an advanced financing district and the advanced financing district would de predetermine the trips that a uh, development a future development may have uh, into that intersection similar to what happened with the tractor supply store if you remember that that story of their trip generation and what that percentage of cost um, was and it's on this sheet here just a little bit further down the list we would apply that to each property that that provides trip generation to this intersection okay so you're going south and you're going north and you're going east and you're going west so as those properties either develop or redevelop we would apply that trip generation calculation to them which is in addition to the SDC that they're paying to transfer for transportation okay so, so are you only talking on 213 Potentially, it could be too. Uh, it could be Tolliver, depending on what happens on okay, Tolliver. Okay, but not two eleven. No, this one not two eleven. Okay. okay. So we're planning on paying for it with a, a additional assessment on all new development. Well, yes and no, depending on what they have. Okay, if you apply this advanced financing district category two. Uh, the same process and procedure that happened with the tractor store okay so if a different property had come in to develop here rather than the tractor supply store they would have applied it would have been a similar equation applied to that property so what we're looking at here is saying okay the tractor supply store came in they have a future contribution to this intersection and the number that they're required to contribute is on this sheet of paper here mm -hmm. and that takes the if you look at the tractor supply contribution it takes the city it takes that number right off that comes right off that 2.247 million mm -hmm. their 247,000 drops that number right off okay so other properties that in the future would want to develop or redevelop would fall into a similar category, okay? They're paying for their trips. That's what an advanced financing district creates. How many properties are even available for Well, that? we we haven't actually done the work that we would need to do to create the advanced okay. financing district, but off the top of my head, you're looking at um, seven or eight okay okay mm -hmm. um potentially maybe a couple more but seven or eight right in that area okay. um some of them you'll there's another property that's right next to the tractor supply store that hasn't developed yet that's mm -hmm. kind of inching towards coming forward um you have a couple of properties between this piece and safeway that would mm -hmm. fall into the category right. and then you have the the uh the vet clinic, I don't know if he is or isn't, but yeah. potential, there's potential there. Um, and then to the south, you have the Sawyer truck yard there that at some point it mm -hmm. might be beneficial for them to do something. So that's what the advanced financing district does is it provides that future payback um, for, for our share of this project. The second one there is system development charge. It is a capital improvement. So we can tap into those future SDC payments that would be made as part of this. Okay. The third one there is reimbursement. And what that means is, is that whenever a, a capital improvement is made, that reimbursement for the folks that come later to pay it back, you could readjust that number. So it might readjust, the total SDC may not change, but how much we can apply to reimbursement would change. So that would grow, even if the number doesn't change. Um, we found out today that we have the ability to use some of our fund exchange dollars. There's uh, their federal exchange, 
federal exchange dollars for, sorry, I had to repeat that because I was <laughs> slurring my words there. Um, Today, that equals about 500,000 that the city could tap into today, okay? Um, and then I talked about the tractor supply um, and the debt service, how we would pay this back technically is we would use our gas tax funding and then these dollars would be debt payback. So we would replace our gas tax funding with, with the dollars that for debt payment. Worst case scenario, if you look at the spreadsheet that Gerald Fisher put together over here, our gas tax dollars that we bring in annually more than cover the cost of paying this loan back. So if we get, we have no money coming in from anywhere else, worst case scenario, this, you know, worst case, we have no money, the, uh, and we have to use our, our, uh, um, our gas tax funds to pay this debt, we have the money to do that if, if, if it happens. And what we've set up for you here is a 10 year term loan, a 15 ter year term loan based on the percentages that we've received from the ODOT bank. And, and then if you move across uh, the annual cost for that semi-annual semi payments there, all of those numbers that you see on the right column are well below our gas tax dollars that we bring in. So for either and, loan, 10 or 15 years, either one. So what I'm, what I'm telling you is, I guess from an administrative standpoint is that we have a pretty good plan here that lays out how we would pay it back. Um, we had some comments in the past about, you know, the, the folks that live in the community that use this intersection daily to go north to go to work, <clears throat> they're not going to pay for this. They're not going to directly see any cost increases for any of their services that they use today in order to pay, for, in order for us to enter into this agreement with ODOT to make this needed improvement happen. Okay. So this gas tax funding, do we currently use it someplace? What do we use it for right. now? Right. What we use it for now is it funds it funds our, our uh, a lot of our um, street maintenance program. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but that's why I said worst case scenario, <laughs> yeah. worst case scenario, if all these other things don't come in, we, we have the funding available to, to do that. Now, the other thing that I added here was we don't have the county VRF funding. We don't have that yet, but that would fall into the same category there, which would increase that those those dollars right. that we don't have today. Um, we believe those funds are going to start rolling in. What did we think next spring? That's what we were. Hoping. We're thinking next spring those funds would start rolling in, which would increase that dollar amount there. So do we know how much? Excuse me. Do we know how much? Um, it's. It's only about $180,000 a year based on the projections that we received from Clackamas County. Right. But again, if it's $180,000 a year, it still was pretty close to paying that debt payment that we would have to have. Um, so. What is VRF? Fund? The vehicle registration. That. Oh, thank you. New one. Yeah. That new fee. That yeah. the county. Mm -hmm. I didn't recognize that. That was passed that. by the county. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, th that's the presentation. I think there's, um, uh, I think the the city of Malala. Some of this is my opinion. You have to you have to do something to make things happen. Sometimes um, this is an opportunity for the city to participate in the needed improvement, um, and the city's been waiting for years for some of those needed improvements to occur. Um, and as I said. Uh, uh, the state is here tonight. If you have any, any questions for them, um, they did assure me tonight that the project is going to be done in house. Uh, the issues of cost overruns or increased costs, they can talk to you about that a little bit, but because they've made that decision to do that in house, will help control that quite a bit. 
Um, when you say in-house, you mean in our house or in their house? In their house. <laughs> okay. Yeah, in their house. Okay. Yeah, we solved that in our house problem. We can't solve that in our house. All right. So, yeah. So yeah, if you have any other questions good. for me, I'll happy to answer them. But um, can you speak a little bit more about this ODOT fund exchange? What would you like to know? I don't understand it. <laughs> okay, they're federal dollars that come into the state of Oregon and the state keeps track of them for each city based on our population. And they're dollars that just continue to grow. Um, we've used them here in Malala in the past, um, and, uh, but we haven't used them, we haven't tapped into those funds for about three years now. They've grown to $540,000 or something. Mm -hmm. If the city wants to tap into those dollars, we contact ODOT and um, this is a, a very brief summary, okay? We, we contact ODOT, we say we wanna use some, we wanna use our um, fund exchange dollars. And the reason why it's called fund exchange is if we allow ODOT to use it, it's 100%. You get the actual number. If we want to take the money out and use it ourselves, you get it's about 94 cents on the dollar. Okay, so we use we lose some of that, but we're in control of that. So with this particular project, um, we would notify them on what we want to use the funding for, and then they would transfer the funds accordingly as the project moves forward. So you're planning on $400,000 of that, correct? Because um, you show a 1.6 under this, the fund exchange. This, this spreadsheet was done before we had the confirmation that um, it was about 545,000. If we kept the number at, at 500,000, that would drop the $2 million loan to 1.5 million on the payback part. Is the, is the fund exchange limited to road improvements, street, yes. et cetera? Okay, thank you. I have two questions, hopefully easy. I Curious, um, is there any prepayment penalty? Do we have to stick no, within 10 years? We can prepay any time. We can prepay any time. Development, we can make it go by. And the, the other thing is, is if we're approved for a $2 million loan or if we're approved for a $3 million loan and we only use $2 million of it, there's no penalty for not using the whole amount allotted. Okay. And my second question is, why the range of percentage of interest rate 1.5 to 2.5 when it's the same amount of money in the same term, say just in the because first scenario? Because the, the rate gets locked in when we actually get the loan. Okay, so that's a range of potential. Okay. Yeah, he, he just put together potential okay. rates okay. that it potentially could be. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. right. My um, concern is two, two things. One is we have vehicle registration or the VRF that is I think should be used solely for the streets that chatter your teeth around our city. And that is our citizens' money because they're the ones paying into it. To put that into this, I don't like that. My second concern is this looks great until you get two years down the road to start it and it's gone up a million dollars. And that million dollars is on us. And I worked for the state for eight years as, uh, with a private contractor. Not once did I ever see them not overrun, ever. And I guarantee you, they will. So that is my other concern. It's definitely a risk. So. If I recall correctly, haven't they taken some steps to help ensure that not ensure but to work toward that not happening as much as it had on other projects previously? I believe they said yes. That, yes. However, when does this start, 2021? Work will begin in 2020, because I work 
survey work is starting now and design work starts in No, I'm talking about the ex actual. I'm sorry. The actual. I'm sorry, Tobin. The actual work. Actual work of physically. Physically building it. You're when we go into here, this microphone is on as well. That might be simpler. You, you might go. want to get comfy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Because, you know, you can lock the surveying in. You can lock a lot of that in. What you can't lock in is materials. Mm -hmm. In 2021, materials and the construction costs are going to go up. Absolutely. Uh, well, so first of all, construction year is... I think we're looking at 22 or 2023, depending on right of way, like extended right of way, just just for clarification and mm -hmm. full like transparency. Um, we do build, uh, we build inflation into our cost estimates, and we we've been using inflation of six percent annually um, to construction year, like to to bidding year or 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 on an well, essentially to bidding year. So we are actually accounting for uh, the inflation of material costs and labor costs as well out to that con that, that, that intended construction year. So that's to, to address your question about... 6% a year? Yep. Okay. Um, based on research we've been doing in Region 1, um, Inflate, like historically, we've used three percent a year for inflation, but recently on, on public works projects, we're seeing inflation more in the like four to eight percent range. But they're like the economists are telling us that that the numbers are going to come, that the inflation will be going down in the future. We've decided to use six percent, which is for ODOT actually a pretty aggressive number. So that's so added into this. That's already added in included. Okay. okay. What what kind of accountability will there be? I mean, if a project goes over. We obviously have no control over that. How you know what kind of accountability does ODOT have towards us, or to safeguard that, try and stop that? Well, I mean, ODOT, like, as 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 ODOT, um, we have actually been we're pulling money from every every pot, every source we can to fund this project, and we are very committed to like seeing this project through to construction, to absolutely see the safety safety and operational value of the project, and have been I think really creative uh, at the hands of Mandy um, uh, to to pull the to pull the funds together and recognize that it's not a small effort for ODOT or for the city to to pull the funds together. So I mean, in that sense, I think we very much feel like the need to keep the budget. The, like keep the project on target budget wise. Um, I think that we are our our cost estimating and scoping efforts in this like for this particular project and for this upcoming um, step are a lot more uh, I think a, like a lot more practical and based on and pragmatic and based on what we've been seeing in the in the, in like the delivery costs over the last few years, particularly in the greater metro area. So I think that our numbers are, I, have, I guess I have a lot of confidence in our numbers. Okay. But beyond that, I also would say that I have a lot of confidence in our design team and the commitment of the region to, to deliver the project, um, to deliver the project on budget. I would say that there, that as a as a city, you do have control to some extent of scope because as we encounter, like as there are, there are risks in the project and uncertainties that we're going to need to work through, and some of those conversations will be conversations about how we're going to manage, like how we're going to manage those risks and and how we're going to and how we're going to make, uh, I think, good decisions about the scope of the like, how we deliver that scope of project, and some of those conversations will probably engage the city in deciding like where we want like when when if we see potential risks that will add cost, how we want to manage those risks. And I think that the city will be part of that conversation. Okay, but it is you know as um, as Dan said, we are delivering it in house. It'll be out and and to clarify what in house means, um, Region One has what we call a tech center, which it com is comprised of. Um, about 100 engineers and scientists that work on delivering, the, like doing the design of our some percentage of our um, capital program. And so we're, we, in general, we outsource about 70% of our work. This is one of the projects that we're keeping in-house and not sending out to consultants, um, in part because there's so much interest and passion for delivering a roundabout at this location in the region. So I think that that's really heartening as well and um, like, I think reflects our commitment to the project. But we also, we can also, I think, manage the budget a lot better when it's our when it's our own staff that's uh -huh. that's handling it and manage the risk a lot better when it's our own staff that's okay. delivering it 
Can we, uh, it also says, uh, paragraph nine, the agreement is contingent upon an amendment to the STIP. Can you tell us what that amendment is? Well, what you have to amend? Well, the amendment, I'll, I'll let Mandy hop in. Good evening. For those of you I haven't met before, my name is Mandy Putney. I'm the policy and development manager for Region 1. So um, we're in the process of developing the 21-24 STIP, the Statewide Transportation Improvement P Program, and um, Region 1 has developed our draft list that we're about ready to prepare for the Oregon Transportation Commission. The Transportation Commission will compile all of the inputs they received from Region 1 and the other regions around the state, and then we'll provide a, a statewide draft for public review early next year. Um, we're this paragraph here um, relates to the action that the OTC is required to approve the STIP. Okay. And the Federal Highway Administration, they're a part of it too? Yes. Okay. The, the OTC is required to re approve the 21-24 STIP by September of next year. Okay. So and if it's not done, that it's null and void, or the agreement is? Yes. Okay. And right. for clarification, and for clarification, we're advancing a handful of projects that are, are part of the 21-24 steps so that we can start work earlier. And this is one of the projects that we'll be advancing to begin work in 2020 versus, I mean, the rest, which will, will begin in federal fiscal year 21. Okay. Any more questions? What do you need from us? Mm -hmm. approve, uh, approval for you to the, the approval that council would need to make tonight is to authorize the city manager to sign the IGA. Uh, the second component would be for us to move forward with a loan with the um, infrastructure bank. You'll see that when it comes back, but if if we're going to put the work in to put the application in, we want to know you want us to. You will see the final product of that before it is locked in. I just There's, feel like it's the right plan, but it's the wrong time. Because we've got a wastewater plant to build. It's different money. Is it? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. still it's money that comes money. from. It's is it still commingle. But it's still a loan, correct? It's still money. It's still debt. I think we have to bite the bullet and go for it. I really do. I mean, I think our community is growing. That road out there is horrible. Yeah. We're just looking at more and more problems. It's got to be fixed. Mm -hmm. And that was seemed to be one of the number one concerns with the people that came to the tent that we were in um, at the Celebrate Malala. What are we going to do about Tolliver in 213? Mm -hmm. Everybody said that practically. Mm -hmm. I, I think we have to go for it, even though it's going to be very, very difficult. I think the hope with where we are in the economy and with the growth that we're starting to see is that we would see development coming sooner than later. That's why my question about the prepayment mm -hmm. penalty um, to you know get rid of that debt as quick as possible. Yes. But I'm with the mayor on the VRF funding and um, if making every effort possible not to tap into that because the reality is we tried to get a street, you know, fee passed so that we could improve our streets and and didn't happen and that money could potentially take us a few steps further in getting us out of the D and C range on the quality mm -hmm. of our streets up to the, you know, mm -hmm. C and B range, which would be really nice. Mm -hmm. And and we agree with that. I that's good to hear. <laughs> it's the draconian process that mm -hmm. we which is why we put that on there. So There's this is giving us all available options. It doesn't all available necessarily options. mean that we're using all yes. of those options right. for no. this right. government. Exactly. Right. And and that's why I said the worst case scenario, when there's nothing else, we can still pay the loan back With using the, yes. the funds we have today. Mm -hmm. Which takes away from the streets. Yeah. And we don't have to 
determine tonight exactly how this is going to be funded? No, not not specifically. But you need. I thought you needed to. You needed to know how we would uh -huh. in Correct. order to sign the agreement. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I appreciate the information very much. <clears throat> Okay, are there any more questions, concerns? Sam now. No? If not, I would need a motion to allow our city manager to sign the intergovernmental agreement for the Oregon 213 Tolliver Road roundabout. And an authorization to submit an application to the. I'm sorry. For the okay, and an authorization. Can we do that both or separate? Mm -hmm. You can. Well, you can either way. You can buy. Okay. Either way. And an authorization to uh, get the loan. Apply for it. Yeah. Apply for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Application. Mm -hmm. Nobody likes to spend money, but I think this is an important part about Malala growing up. And we are growing up and we had to make some hard decisions. The wastewater treatment plant is gonna be a part of that. It's part of growing up as a city. And um, I think that these funding options that have been put before us make it so that it is attainable so that we can partner with ODOT in this. I don't like the fact that it's out of our control. That's the control freak in me. Yeah, going. Me I wish too. you could like you know, hover <laughs> over it or whatever, but that's not reality. I agree. Um, and the reality is that we're making a contract with them there's some risk in that but there's also reward by getting a finished product so I I would propose that we um, authorize, Dan. authorize Dan to make this intergovernment agreement with ODOT and also to apply for the Oregon Transportation Infrastructure Bank loan okay. I second it okay all in favor aye, aye. aye. opposed I aye. think hey, we have one opposed okay Oh, thank you. Now I can exhale. You can exhale. Thank you, thank you for coming. Yes, thank, thank you. you. And okay. I'm going to hold you to keeping the price down. Okay. <laughs> okay. You'll be hearing from us. <laughs> You'll have 9,000 people beating on your door. <laughs> we will also be doing a lot of outreach and education about Great. about for the community. So I think we'll probably have some conversations about the best way to do that. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, it's going to yeah. be important. Appreciate it. Yes, it is. Absolutely. It really is. Okay, now item B, food cart ordinance, community and restaurant survey results. Ms. Cannon, Mrs. Cannon, sorry. Do you have the floor. Several pages. Several pages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mayor and Council, uh, I have a presentation for you. If you want to see this, uh, that uh, summarizes the recent survey monkey. Yeah. No. Summarizes the recent survey monkey we put out to the community. Oops. So as you may recall, we had two surveys. Um, we have one that was open to the, all community members, and then one that was just invitation only, focused on the restaurant and uh, owners and managers. It opened up on September 18th, and we closed it just last week on October 15th. So we had a very good response, very pleased. Um, I didn't give it on the first um, result there, I didn't give it as a percentage because that is open to the community and so it was pushed out on social media and other other venues uh, but we did send out 268 email invitations and we received 240 responses I think that's pretty good that's, that's a high. very high yeah. percentage percentage uh, restaurant owner managers we had eight responses out of 18 44 percent again pretty good for an online survey and I, I feel proud of the fact that we did walk around um, and visit with each of the restaurant owners and managers and encourage them to participate. So that was good. Uh, so I'm going to summarize the community survey first. Um, a resounding yes um, to the question of whether the city should allow food carts and trucks inside the city. Um, where should they be located? So a mixture of answers there, 87 88% in downtown Malala. Um, there was some, six, about 63% in commercial areas outside downtown, and a little bit over 40% in the industrial areas. Um, 
So the question, if you're a business owner, would you support food cart, food truck in your parking lot? 76% said yes, about 24% said no. If you're a property owner, would you support, would you support it on your property? Um, a food cart, food truck on your property? 60% said yes, about 40% said no. Would you pur purchase food from a food, food cart, food <laughs> truck? Yes, <clears throat> yes. So this was a question about how people would get there. We expected that this would be pretty high for people driving to it, especially during the rainy season. But we were interested in if people would be interested in walking or some other mode. And so it came out about 75%, 76% drive. 15% walk and about 9% other modes. So those were the, that were opposed to food carts. They were most concerned about um, the potential that food carts would take away from the small town feel, particularly with traffic congestion around them and parking issues around them. Um, some concern that there are already restaurants, enough restaurants in town and we have trouble supporting them today and this would only sort of um, dilute the support that could be given to existing restaurants. Um, and then again, sort of getting back to that earlier comment about some food carts don't provide enough parking and create traffic congestion. So this person said, leave the food carts in Portland. <laughs> um, we did get some advice and because we asked the open-ended question in the survey, uh, what uh, advice or other comments might you have? We, uh, there was a resounding feeling about a lot of excitement around this program, the fact that this could bring more dining options to the community, um, a sentiment that food carts need to follow the same regulations as brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. uh, amongst a few, a, a preference for food cart pods rather than the individual food cart, food trucks. Um, there was a sentiment about making sure they're attractive, they look good, not an eyesore. And also the comment on the bottom I thought was interesting about should be done modestly, a couple food tr trucks is best with variety, wanting to make sure there's variety of food there. So restaurant survey summary, um, a little bit more of a mixed bag than you saw. Should the city allow food carts, trucks inside the city 63% yes, 38% no. And again, this was out of eight responses. So just remember that. Eight out of 18 total. If yes, where should they be located? Different answer than you saw um, earlier with the community survey. In commercial areas outside downtown, 80% support there downtown. And the industrial areas, 40% each. So I think a general sentiment that um, outside downtown might be better. If you're a business owner, would you support a food cart, food truck in your parking lot? Not surprised with this result, 40% said yes, 60% said no, because that would be competition. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, if you're a property owner, would you support food truck on your property? It's 50-50 uh, on that one. So those opposed to food carts are most concerned about negative impact on the current businesses in town, and then just that that issue of operating costs, just the thought that, that brick and mortar restaurants have to pay different um, operating costs and more operating costs than food carts. The, these two comments are the same um, around the question about other comments and advice. Um, there is a sentiment expressed twice here about the fact that there's property on the east side of downtown near the Y that might be a good location for uh, food cart pod. So in terms of next steps, I'm really interested in any comments you have this evening. Um, we did share these with uh, Planning Commission on o October 2nd, so we did get a few comments there. Um, I'm interested in hearing what your thoughts are after seeing the results. Um, our intention is to um, bring some options back for your consideration in the winter sometime either December, January, in that time frame. And then we'll do a little bit of back and forth policy discussion as needed. Um, and then uh, we'd like to bring a draft before you in winter, uh, spring of next year. Well, thank you. Um, 
I guess I can start with comments on it because I spent quite a few years in the food business, but and I went to uh, school with one of the owners of a fast food restaurant here that was very concerned when McDonald's was coming in. I'm closing up. I'm selling. I'm done. I'm out of business. They're going to put. They have more business yeah, than, than when McDonald's came than yeah. before McDonald's came in. So, um, and yes, there are restaurants in town, but we have very few choices. We have Mexican food. We have Chinese food. We have. That's about it. If you go out to dinner. Well, and even if we pass this, it doesn't mean we're going to have them. Right. Well, I know yeah. some people that want to develop a food, you know, a pod, and the pod would consist of a covered area to eat. Kind of a sports theme, I guess. I don't know. And and have uh, beer and probably wine, which I'm not a fan of. But but anyway. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> sorry. Oh, now we know. So how would you monitor beer and wine in a food pod? What's that? How would you monitor beer and wine in a food pod? You're not in a bar. Where you're... It's similar to what they yeah. have in Happy Valley where it's an enclosed space. They have a vendor that's inside there. Mm -hmm. They are a licensed right. vendor. Right. Southeast 82nd is the same And they, the same and they thing. card yeah. people and have age restriction mm -hmm. and everything? Yeah. Yep. Uh, not, inside the, not, inside the, not inside the pod. There's not an age restriction. They have, it's family oriented, but... Mm -hmm. um, it's but not a bar area. environment. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. It's like a ski lodge, you know, if you kind of think about it, that kind of family environment, but mm -hmm. they have adult mm -hmm. beverages. And I agree that it needs to be pleasing to the eye. And of course, they're under the same, uh, the county will hold them to the strict regulations. They hold brick and mortar businesses. They will. Oh, yeah. Yep. No I mean, other entity a, holds them. Food from a cart. food licensing standpoint. From the food, yes. food licensing. Yes. The food so. licensing, yes, but the licensing from the health department is much different for food carts than it is brick and mortar. It's much more relaxed. I think so we're they, talking about we don't have control things. over yeah. that. Yeah. You're talking no, about the pod. Right. That's a building that's going to require ADA and all of that right. stuff. Right. Right. Indoor plumbing, the whole bit. But if you're just talking about a food cart that parks in a lot, that's a different ball. No, right? a pod okay. is open. Yeah, no, I, I there know, are food but, carts, but you have an enclosed area people can take their food right, to eat. Right, but we're... Oh, let's see, how am I put this? <laughs> they have the same we sanitary really, standards. Yeah, but we don't really know what's going to come. Mm -hmm. Well, well I, pardon sorry, me. Sorry, go ahead. I thought what I heard you say was that the county would have control over how that... Uh, particular food truck was built. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. The sanitary, the, the, the cleanliness, yeah. sanitary, yes. the food. Right, right. Yes. No, we would have control over what it would look like, the requirements. And where they're allowed. And where they're allowed. Yeah. So, because right now, the reality is we do have at least one food cart in town. Um, we have people who are interested in bringing more, but we don't have anything to guide the do's and don'ts. Right. We don't have anything right. that says you can or can't. We don't have anything that gives that structure mm -hmm. so that the city right. knows so how to. to. So we need mm -hmm. to do something so that the city staff has a way to manage these things in the planning commission going forward. Mm -hmm. And put whatever boundaries around it, you know, if it's pods and trucks or mm -hmm. where they go, where they, you know, it's, it's, that's what we can do. And I'm prepared in the coming months here to bring drafts forward to answer, help get answers to some of these policy questions you're raising. Um, so I, I, we don't need to have a big discussion this evening, but I am interested in any just uh, thoughts and reactions you had to the survey results. How many cities have you contacted that already have these, that the ins and outs, the do's and don'ts, the failures, the successes? About six, half dozen or so okay. at this point that are all in this general Clackamas County area close by and a variety of different sizes. And I think the other thing that's important is that we all have our personal opinions on yes. food cart yes. pods or whatever that we've gone to. Right. You know, whether you've 
whether you've gone to one in Central Oregon or you've gone to one downtown or you've gone to one in Happy Valley or Milwaukee or wherever you went, mm-hmm. we all have those opinions on mm-hmm. what you, th- you think would be something we right. want in, in our community mm-hmm. as well. So I've gone to wonderful ones and I've gone to ones where I won't eat. <laughs> so I've done that with restaurants too. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I but, support the staff moving forward yes. with putting yes, together yeah. an ordinance and language and sort of all those requirements so that we could look at that. That would be my personal opinion. And I agree with that. that. I think the survey indicated that that people wanted Mm -hmm. food carts here. Mm -hmm. And even though it's a small survey, if it got bigger, you'd have the same answers. Mm -hmm. Statistically. Mm -hmm. Statistically, yes. I think it's important. What was interesting about the results is important to to note that the results between the community and the restaurant owners are different. And Mm -hmm. so um, particularly around whether they should be located in downtown, in or near downtown. So I, I, I was noticing to. that as well. I thought I, I wanted to speak to that. I, Malala is not that big. I don't see why we need to necessarily place them right downtown. Right. Because it's a very, it would be, you know, we, it, I think it would be a kindness to the local restaurant, the ones that are there, that have been there, and that uh, um, have made investment in the community. A respect. It would be a kindness to them to take their thoughts into consideration when we decide to place a pod or whatever we do. And and on the flip side of that, I think it would help build the community downtown, which we're trying to revitalize downtown. And if there's more dining options downtown, I think it would bring people into town more. You should always like to go where there's more of something. Right. So but but Malala's not that big. It, you know, it's two minutes down the road one way or the other, and we're in the industrial well, section. I, I find this is interesting. This says in commercial areas outside downtown. Isn't most of downtown and the street going to, I mean, our streets, commercial is a lot of area. Downtown. Yeah. You but are, industrial areas, it's really low, and I that would be more of our some of our outside area. I think the reason they say I'm, I've worked at uh, business or companies um, in industrial areas mm-hmm. that, you know, hey, 10 o'clock time for the gut wagon. Mm-hmm. But when that leaves, they're gone. They're done for the day. So they go from area to area, right. which I really didn't want to see happen. But I mean, these these are businesses are competitive. This is a this is we can't keep business or keep progress out because people are afraid of competition. I have found in my lifetime that if it's good, people will come. If it's not, they won't. It doesn't matter if you have a hundred restaurants or two. That's mm-hmm. just the facts of life. So, um, Any other feedback, mayor and council? We're excited to move forward, and um, we were pleased with the response the community gave us. So this was really, really helpful. And thank you for thank doing you that outreach and getting that survey information because that really, you know, tells us, gives us, you know, the ability to say yes. Let's think about this more. I mean, I think from a practical standpoint, I think we have to come up with something. I think so. Too. Um, mm-hmm. But from a, a kind of a more let's improve the livability by adding some new things here. I mean, I think that's, it. there's just a part of us that it responds to the visioning that mm-hmm. we've been working through and people wanting more options as well. So like the other said, I think the further you went out with the survey, you'd probably statistically get the same type of feedback. So and to get our citizens supported. to start spending their dollars in Malala. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Not everywhere else as they do now. Mm-hmm. So. Okay. Well, thank okay. you. Yes, yes. Thank you. Alice. Don't leave though, because item C is industrial hemp potential regulations for new processors, and Mrs. Cannon has the floor for that also. Mayor and Council, um, I just want to thank uh, Jacob for coming this evening. Um, it was a big, big help. So thanks for your time. Um, I also want to emphasize that the regulations we're talking about would not apply to the com- this company. So right. HTC, they're already located here. So what we're talking about are some regulations that would apply to new facilities that would come to town potentially in the future. So 
Okay. With that in mind, um, just in, uh, Jacob and his partner, uh, Billy Koshef, um, we visited with them in uh, May and June of last year. And they asked, what are your regulations on industrial hemp? And we had to go and look at our code. It turns out that the, the current marijuana regulations did apply. They were broadly the, the definition of marijuana and cannabis fit in with the hemp. Um, so, um, so it fit. And so we, um, when they asked where they could locate, we directed them to the areas that are there in the light green which are defined as the production district in the current marijuana retail and production district. So I just wanted you to know, we did have a meeting. Um, it started out with a um, what's called a land use compatibility statement because um, CHTC had to go through a licensing process with the Oregon Department of Agriculture. They are not regulated by OLCC as the marijuana industry is. So uh, prior to that, they have to come to the city and and seek our approval of this land use compatibility statement to make sure it's in the right zone and make sure the infrastructure supports the industry and so forth. So we had a series of meetings. We included the fire district in the meeting as well, just to make sure that everything was going to be safe and good to go for our infrastructure and for our land uses. That was pretty helpful before they came to town. And I just wanted you to know this map was pretty important in that conversation. So in terms of potential new regulations, I will say that our current code um, is very thin on siting standards. And given what we're, we're learning from the community feedback we're getting, it, I think it would be very helpful to um, consider some regulations that we've seen in other communities. And that would be having loading and processing fully enclosed inside of a facility or inside of a warehouse. Um, the operations today at CHTC are not fully enclosed, um, and I, I really appreciate the fact that, that that may be changing in the future, but for future industries, we want, might want to ensure that that happened. Um, that we also, we require engineered air filtration and ventilation systems designed um, to filter air and offensive odors and to make sure that's designed by a licensed mechanical engineer. And the other question we, we might want to think about is going back to the map is just evaluate whether the location in light green is appropriate, really appropriate for industrial hemp or whether we should be looking at some other industrial zones, other parts of the city. I did not bring an industrial zoning map, but if you look kind of to the south of downtown, maybe southwest a bit there, I'm going to use the pointer here. And kind of this area, if you see mm -hmm. this area, some we have some industrial here and we have some industrial here and kind of through here. So the question is, is this the right map for industrial hemp or might we want to locate it more in the M2 zone? So these are some things we can consider. I'm interested in your reaction. Mostly I'm here to make sure we get a nod, um, general nod, not a vote, but a general nod that this is a good use of our time to look at some additional regulations for, um, for industrial hemp, for new facilities in the city. Um, but maybe what also if, that, if the answer is yes, what is your reaction to the last slide? Let me move that forward here. Some of the issues that we raised here. So that's really what we're here tonight. And I'm interested in any comments you might have as well. If um, I know one of the complaints was noise, and of course there's, in my opinion, for the certain indust industry, needs to be placed where there's not a lot of housing, um, to either that or a noise barrier, such as the ones they put along freeways for the housing, but that would be the only thing I see. Was there complaints about noise all the time when the kitty litter place was operating? Because if it's using the same kind of equipment, I can't see how that was as so different. It's not operated for how many yes. years? Yes. Okay, I, didn't, I had no idea. The, I don't know if it's There was no housing operated. there when it did. Uh, okay. Did have a lot of complaints about noise? The, That's what I wondered. The current site that they're in today has been vacant for long since I've been here. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and none of the staff that are here today can answer anything before you that. Around. <laughs> we have historically, um, 
with Brentwood. I think it used to be called Brentwood. Yeah. Yes. Brentwood. Yes. Mm -hmm. The cabin. Um, the cab no, no. It's something else today, and I, I lost it. Um, we have had periodic complaints by folks about about that cabinet shop, mm -hmm. depending on what they're doing, at what time of day they're doing it. But I, but I think we have to recognize in Malala, Malala's kind of a got a couple of strange um, things going on with it, and it's like a sound vortex. Okay, mm -hmm. you can stand next to something and not hear it, and then you can be across town, and you can it's it's like you're right next to it. Um, so there's there's different things that that happen. Um, I'm not a sound engineer; it's difficult. Um, we had issues with uh, Pack Fiber when they came in. They moved some things around a little bit. We haven't had any complaints. I don't know what they did, but they did something. Um, the other thing is, if you look at the city map, it's very difficult to find industrial sites that that are not going to have any impact on residential yeah. developments at all. Right. Okay, the there's a heavy industrial site right across the street from the high school football field. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. which is surrounded by residential uses. Uh, you know, there's one right across the street from Bymart that's got no light and heavy industrial mm -hmm. uses. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, you know, the issue is, is that to be cognizant of what kind of impacts are they having, you know, um, you know, it's kind of the, we don't want to deter business or industry, but we also, we're only so big. We want to we want to make sure people aren't negatively impacted, and and I think that's what Alice is is looking to try to do here is create some regulations that provide the ability for the city to say, you know, you need to have some additional standards applied to you because you could impact this neighborhood across across the way because sound travels here. Yeah. Yes, it does. And it's growing pains. Estacada is in a perfect position now. Their industrial park is almost yeah. a mile outside of the city, but they're going through, you know, they're getting ready to put in hundreds, almost a thousand homes. So they're going to run into the same problems. It's really tough. It really is. And the only thing that will ever solve it is expanding our urban growth boundary. Right. <laughs> I'm not here to talk about that today. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. But I mean, that's you know, just. So what does she need from us? So I think I think what we're asking. In the right direction. We're yes, asking you're in the right tonight direction. is, are we heading the right direction? Yes. Do you think it's necessary? Yes. Um, and and I know some of the things that were brought up tonight are things that the current operator is actually looking mm -hmm. at. So. Well, correct me if I'm wrong. Don't we already have noise ordinances in place? They're actually uh, fairly weak as it relates to industrial noise. It's it's a it's a, kind of almost an exemption for industrial and commercial noise, um, really. So it it doesn't give us uh, our current nuisance ordinance does not give us many tools uh, for to regulate um, or even cite that issue for commercial or industrial users. Because remember, when I was young. 90% of of <laughs> 90 of the uh, industrial areas are open now were sawmills. Right. And noise all the time. Noise all the time. Mm -hmm. And noise. You just, just got, got used, used to, to it. it. Yeah. And I, yeah. my house. Doesn't back up to Tolliver, but I'm right on the edge of that mm -hmm. dotted line there. And I can hear both the sawmills going all the time. Mm -hmm. But what's house, nice. Even with my windows closed. Mm. <laughs> so it's just. Yeah. But what am I going to do about it, right? Well, what's nice is so far, uh, you know, people like Mr. Crabtree here have been very um, great about solving these problems. You get people coming in that say, I don't care. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You let me in, there's no ordinances. So. But usually the the industry that we've had here is very recept receptive of that. So, And I thank you for that. So yeah, looking you're, at your map, are you wanting us to? Would we have to actually rezone stuff in order to keep anybody out of those areas, like the light green that you're showing on the map here? 
No, not rezone. It's a, just a consideration that we planners would have to think about coming to you with a proposal that would say, should it be, should industrial hemp be allowed in M2 zones also? Because I think, I'm not sure, but I think that the light green is only in um, the light industrial zone right. today. Okay. So right. it's just a question. So we'll come forward with a proposal and you can react to it. Okay. So sure. you don't need to rezone anything. We'll do some of that. Um, preliminary thinking and you can give us your reaction and give us more direction after that. Okay. Great. Thank you, Alice. Thank, Thank you. you, Alice. Mm -hmm. <sighs> With that, we're on to item nine, reports. Does the staff have any reports? Alice, you don't have any reports. No, no report. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny? I have nothing. No? I have nothing. <clears throat> I thought you had one. <laughs> okay. Okay. The retreat? I feel okay. so put on the spot. <laughs> if I Which, do, I don't remember what it is. You know, she's got, My daughter's she's getting got married in two days, in so oh, I have a wedding yeah, brain. Get it. Did we ever decide a retreat location? Or? Um, yeah, they're working on that. Good. Okay. So one of the things I wanted to bring up to you all today is that we did receive an application for your vacant seat. Oh, wait, that's Natalie's vacant seat. So. Um, and if you're all agreeable, we can bring that individual in front of you at your November meeting. Okay, mm -hmm. so what I have is um, some questions, sample questions for city council appointment. Okay. You recall those? The last ones we did, you can take one and pass one down. Uh, if you want to look at those and we could, if you don't want to do that and you just want to, we have one candidate so you don't have to ask the same candidate the same question. So um, if you want to look at those and I can pare them down and but it's probably important that we ask some questions and we can, and you all can grill that individual. Okay. So Great. you can let me know about that in the next few days. Um, and the mayor mentioned this earlier, but if you're driving south on 213 or north on 213, this, the speed signs are in. Uh, so hopefully that will be helpful. Our, uh, police officers have been out, out there reminding people um, sometimes by pulling them over that the speed zone has changed. So folks should recognize that. Uh, Gerald asked me to read his report into the record for you all tonight. It so <laughs> I thought I would. <laughs> what is the whole thing? No, I'm Can you give us the Oh, thank you, because we have it here. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I was looking at Leota's face. So, <laughs> seems like there was something else we were going to bring up. What am I missing? You're not out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if I think about it after you finish, I will remember okay. and tell you. But that's all for me. Okay. Uh, I want to thank uh, Alice and Leota both for the reach out to get another. Uh, person to apply for counsel. Yeah, I see you're smart. <laughs> and uh, it's been a long time coming, a long time coming. And uh, what, oh, uh, a week ago last Tuesday, I met with the mayors from Sandy Estacada and Canby. We had lunch at the White Horse and we have formed a group we we tend at c4 meetings if we're outside of uh metro we tend to get shoved aside as if we don't have a vote so we have gotten together and formed a consortium of the cities the stepchild cities i guess <laughs> or you could call yourself the four musketeers the four musketeers thank you anyway yeah, i mean they it. came up with a logo and everything so i and when it's finished i'll bring it here but what we did was we have a consortium now so that we can uh, vote as a block. Uh, we each have one vote, and we have found that that works to get something done in the cities outside of Metro. 
so that we're not ignored. So hopefully it works. That's all I have. I don't think I have anything right now. I, the only thing I have to announce is that we're hosting the Chamber of Commerce breakfast. November 14th. Thank you. Thursday. Thursday, November 14th at 7 a.m. 7.45. Oh, they close enough. Good. I swear I don't come at 7 a.m. <laughs> I, 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 I think I that maybe Christy should just tell about it. <laughs> <laughs> Between the two of us, we got it. Uh, doors, I suspect doors at City Hall will open by 7.30 and we'd like to begin by 7.45. Is it too late for people to put their name down for the Clackamas City's dinners, dinner tomorrow night? Yes. Okay, <laughs> never mind. We will be discussing the visioning uh, program that morning. Carla and Good. Good. Nice. Okay, Councillor Palumbo. Uh, there's a writer's group forming here in Malala. A what? A writer's group. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. There is. And they are very excited to know that we're trying to develop some cultural support for them. They're already talking about um, a, a, an author's open house where they invite local authors and have them do an open house with book they're planning in February and they're having meetings and they're very um, very interested in in getting what support we can give them all right yeah councillor newland i don't have anything i don't have anything okay with that i would need a motion to adjourn in a second so moved second all in favor aye, aye. okay we are adjourned <laughs>